In a large steam power plant, the condenser, where the steam is condensed to liquid, can be assumed as a shell and tube heat exchanger. Okay, so we know exactly what we're talking about, just like the one we saw on the practical. The heat exchanger consists of a single shell and 30,000 tubes, each executing two passes. So let's go ahead and I have grabbed this off the internet. Okay, so this is this um, shoe, uh, shell and tube heat exchanger. And what that sentence is telling us is that for there's like 30,000, there's 30,000 of these guys here, right? Um, and then what the thing is telling us is that for every one, single one of these guys, let me increase this, every one of these guys, the tubes, they go and they pass twice, right? So it's like a, you can think of it as a U-shaped tube if you want to. Okay? That will be important because whatever the length is here, the length of this heat exchanger here, right? The tube, our tubes will be like 2L, right? So the, the um, two would be 2L, right? The length of the two would be 2L. Okay, that's really the, and that's honestly the only trick on this question from my perspective. From what I see, it's the only thing that can, might get you, because that would be something that's different for you guys too, that we haven't seen before. Um, the tubes are constructed with a diameter of 25 mils and steam condenses on their outer surface. This is important information. Steam condenses, you guys can recall already week two. Um, the convective coefficient of the outer one is 11,000 and the inner one is 7,000 and a half. Um, the heat transfer rate is two times 10 to the ninth watt. So this is new too, because they generally don't give us the Q, they ask us to calculate it. And this is accomplished by passing cooling water through the tubes at a rate of three, uh, 30,000 kilograms per second. So because we have 30,000 tubes, that means that each tube is, has one kilogram per second of water flowing through it. Assuming that the heat capacity of water is constant and equal to 4179, the water enters at 20 and the steam condenses at 50. What is the temperature of the cooling water emerging on the condenser side? What is the required length per pass? Okay, so know that there's no, no mention here to um, NTU or to the, um, C sub P of the steam, right? So from that, we can infer that this is not an NTU problem. This will be a delta T log mean problem, right? Cool, so what do we need to find out? We need to find out what is the temperature of the cooling water when it leaves? So temperature of cold out, and what is the length per pass? So what's no L? Okay, length per pass. So we're looking for this L here that I drew here before. This would be one pass and this would be one pass, right? So that will be half the length of each tube, if you will. Now, how are we gonna go about this? We know that um, surface area through which things are exchanging energy, the overall heat transfer coefficient, the f factor, the correction factor, and the delta T, log me, right? We know all these things. Well, the other thing is said about this guy, so we can assume this to be one. Um, the area, as we learned before, the area is all, always in these guys, on these heat exchanges with the area of the inner and the outer are very similar, so we can consider the same area. Okay, so what do we need to, so we have this fellow already, this has been given. Um, we can calculate this, we need to find this, we need to find this, and if we can find all those things, we can find the area. And we know the area, area, is two pi r l times the 30 thousand tubes times two. And that times two there is what gets a lot of people because that's like I said, this is the tricky bit of this question because since each two passes twice, then we're gonna have twice the area for each for each l here, l being one pass of the two, right? So it's the same way of thinking, okay, um, if we do the area the, the way we did previously, that'll be the same thing, right? Two pi, the total length of each tube times uh, R, right? That will be area times the number of tubes that we have. But now since we know um, our L is actually 
two, two L equals one tube, so then we have to have a two there, okay? And that's why I define my L as being this distance right from the beginning. So that really is the only thing that's different on this problem. What are we gonna do? We're gonna find um, our, we can find our delta T log means and our uh, overall heat transfer coefficient so that we can solve this problem. But to find our delta T log means, we need to find temperature of the cold out. So we can start by actually finding our temperature of the cold out, which is going to be related to our delta T log mean. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna simplify this drawing into one of those drawings that we like so much, which makes a lot of sense in our heads, which says that there will be a hot fluid, in this case it's steam, and steam is gonna be running through the system, coming in at 50 Celsius. And we're gonna have on the other side, we're gonna have water. This is gonna be our cold water. And it's gonna be coming in at uh, 20, was it? 20. So we're entering this guy at 20 Celsius, right? Now, you guys recall uh, the second week of classes in which we had a problem with steam and we talked about the idea that when we have steam changing, condensing, or in this case, yeah, steam condensing or water evaporating or water uh, solidifying or ice melting or any change phase whatsoever, the energy doesn't come from the change of, en the change of temperature, but come from the change of phase, right? And then you guys recall that if steam is condensing, the temperature of steam is not gonna change whatsoever. What's going to change is the phase from steam to water, and that will give us energy. So if that's happening, the temperature on the inside of the outside of the shell, regardless of where it's entering or not, steam is gonna be the same temperature. So you guys can jump back on week two and have a look at that problem there. You see this more explanations around this. This is our situation, and that's why it doesn't really matter whether I say uh, the 20 is on this side or on this side here. Okay, but check it out. If this is a case, and we know obviously energy will be going from this guy to this side to this side, right? Like so, that will be our heat just there. And we know that our heat, our heat is the mass flow rate of the cold times the C sub P of the cold times the delta T of the cold, which is the same as the mass flow rate of the hot times the C sub P of the hot times the delta T of the hot. But we also know this is equal to two times 10 to B nine. So two times 10 to nine watts, right? So we don't really need to use everything. We just need to find, because we need to find this guy here. We can just use the code straight off the bat. What is the mass flow rate of the code? That will be 30,000 kilograms per second. 30,000 kilograms per second, because we have 30,000 tubes, each with one kilogram per second. Our CP has been given to be 4179 joules per kilograms per Kelvin, and our delta T will be, and watch out, because this is where we can go wrong with this equation, right? We know that this value, that's this value over here, the one that's being outputted by the water has to be greater, right? Because the water is absorbing energy. Therefore, it has to be larger than 20. So therefore, the way I'm gonna set up this equation is temperature of the cold out minus 20, and not the other way around. And this has to be equal to Timson to the ninth, and this is joules per second. So note that joules and joules, seconds and seconds, kilograms and kilograms, and we're gonna have the Kelvin going to the other side as the unit for difference in temperature. So this means that my temperature cold out will be 20, 36, 36 Celsius, which is one of the answers we needed to solve this problem. So now I can come here and put this down as 36. That's too thick. That's 36 Celsius. Okay, so that's one of the parts of the problem. But now what we can do is now we can find our delta T log mean, right? Because let's go down one step like that. Because we can do the difference over here. Oops. Wrong thing. The difference over here, delta T1, and that will be 30, C. We can do the difference over here, and that will be 14, and that is T2. So when I do the delta T log mean, I know it has to be somewhere in between these two numbers here. All right, so that'll be, um, if it were a simple mean, we will have exactly the middle point is in a linear scale, but since it's not a linear scale, we're gonna have something that's a bit smaller, right? So our delta T log mean will be, 30 
minus 14 divided by the natural log of 30 divided by 14. And this turns out to be about 21. I got 20.99 something. Okay, so that's one of the things we needed to do to be able to solve our top equation there. Next thing we need to do is what is our overall heat transfer coefficient? So to do that, let's go ahead and go um, probably to the side so you guys can, any of you guys are copying, you can still copy. Now we went in previous class, I think it's last week or the one before, we talked about how um, if you get the sum of Rs, you can do one over this and this, and then we can find, we can um, solve for U and find U. Um, so we had an explanation on how that turns to be, and we know that if the conduction is ignored and the areas are the same, it ends up being that U equals one over H out, one H inner, right? So I'm gonna jump this explanation here. You can check this on previous videos if you guys have, haven't learned this yet. There's a big explanation around how we get that. For now, I'll just go straight into this, which means that this will be one over 11,000, was it? Yeah, 11,000 plus one over 7552. They're both on the same units, which is watts per meter square Kelvin. They're both dividing the division, so they're gonna end up being exactly the unit that we're looking for. And this turns out to be 4478 watts per meter square Kelvin. Okay, so we have everything we need. We have, um, our correction factor, which was one, we didn't consider it. We have our delta T log mean, which is 21. We have our overall heat transfer coefficient. We have our Q. The only thing we don't have at the moment is our area. But for the area, we already have the radius. In case the diameter, we have the diameter. And the only thing we don't know that is an unknown to this problem is the L, which is exactly what we're looking for. So we can go ahead and do that. Let's zoom in back here. Zoom in back here. So I can rewrite this equation as, if I am after, um, okay, let's do in steps. So we can transform this into two pi r l. Uh, let's leave it as n, I guess for now, just to not put the big number there. n is the number of tubes that I have, and everything times two, that would be our area. Then we have u, f has already considered one, and delta t log mean. So if I'm after my l, what I'm going to do is solve for L, so that means that my L will be the Q divided by everything else, right? So 2 pi R L times N times 2 times U times delta T log mean. So let's solve this. We have everything we need. This is 2 times 10 to the ninth divided by to pi constant. Um, actually, we have two pi radius, so I'm just gonna do pi here and just put diameter straight off. The diameter is, what was it? 25 mils. So 25 to the minus three meters. Um, L we are looking for, so that's a L here. Then we have the N, 30,000. We have a two there also have the overall heat transfer coefficient, which is four, four, seven, eight. And delta T log mean, which was 21. This all turns out to be four, approximately 4.51. And this should be meters, but let's check. Okay, so we can be sure um, if everything is correct from our end. So let's have a look at our units here. We have um, watts on the top. Pi doesn't have any unit. Then we have meters. There's no unit. Then there's no unit. There's watts per meter squared Kelvin. And then the bottom we have difference in temperature, which could be Kelvin or Celsius. So um, watts and watts, Kelvins and Kelvins, meters squared with meters. This turns out to be meters. Good. So L for this heat exchanger is about 4.51. 
And we're just double checking. What's that N in between the two? Um, N is the number of pipes. Okay, so remember I had a 30,000 here? Yeah, yeah. So instead of putting, instead of writing down 30,000, just put N there so we can make it uh, less gotcha. smaller as we were writing it. Yep, so this is this 30,000. Okay. Yeah. Um, the reason for that is because we'll need to account for the whole area of the heat exchanger. And so if we have 30,000 tubes, it'll be 30,000 times the area of one tube. Yep, so that's the idea. Thank you. Yep, cool. So let's actually break down that one, one more time, just to be safe. This right here is the surface area of a cylinder, right? Two pi r. Okay, so if we have only one cylinder, it's a shell and tube with only one tube, that will be it. If we have one shell tube with only one tube, that, that, but that tube is like a U-shape, so it goes twice through the shell, that will be two pi r L times two, right? That will be the total area that will be going through the shell. But if we have 30,000 of those and we multiply that by 30,000, that's gonna give us the area of the whole thing that we're dealing with in this problem. Cool, any other questions? Oh, I had a 